All right, folks, today we are going to learn about another control structure. Last class, we learned about if statements. Uh, we learned how we can make decisions in our programs. Today, we are going to learn about for loops. So, for loops are used when we have some action that we want to take a specific number of times in our programs. There are five pieces that go into the building of a for loop. Part one is our for keyword. This is the, uh, the thing that starts it all off. We need this if we are going to have a for loop, obviously, because it's the keyword that is associated with this thing. So we need the for keyword. We need the iterator. Um, that is the name for this variable. Uh, and this variable is going to store uh, how far along we are in our loops. Um, the most common programming name for the iterator in just about any language is I, um, probably because I and iterator start with the same letter. But um, since this is a variable, you can name it whatever you like. But if you do not feel like being creative, I is a perfectly good name. That is. Uh, very indicative that this is the iterator for a loop um, because that is the standard name for it all right after we have our iterator we have the in keyword um, so for and in are kind of a pair here so they they, they just kind of go together so we've got our for iterator in and then we need the thing that is being iterated over. Um, for, for right now, we're going to use the range function. And range is going to give us some list of values um, that our iterator is going to store each time we go through the loop. So this is going to determine how many times our loop is going to run, essentially. And our last piece is the body of the loop. So this will um, run uh, it, each time our loop does its loop. So um, given what you can see here, how what do you think will be printed by this code? What do you think is going to be its output? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey is absolutely correct because we are going to repeat three times the print hey. So we will print hey, we will loop, print hey, we will loop, and we'll print hey. So there we go. There is our structure for a for loop. Um, since the iterator is a variable, we are totally allowed to use it in our loops. We can totally just make use of it. So the range function will always uh, give us some list of numbers. And when we give it one number, the first value in our list of numbers is always going to be zero. And that is because in most programming languages, counting starts at zero instead of starting at one. So that is just an important fact to take note of. Counting starts at zero in Python and many other languages. So our first value will be zero and we will go upward until we hit the number right before the value in our range. So if the value in our range is n, the, um, the numbers that will be created by the range are 0 through n minus 1, which is a number of values that is equal to this number. So I have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different values. So I'm going to loop 5 times. And i is going to equal each of these values in order, one at a time.
Any questions on any of this so far? All right. If I add more numbers to my range function, I can choose both the starting and ending numbers. Because when I only provided one number, I could only choose where it ends. It would always start at zero. If I add a second number to my range, I will choose both starting and ending point. So I can say for I in range one comma five, that will give me the values one, two, three, four. And just like when I use only one number, that ending value is never going to be reached. Our loop will, our range will always stop one short of our ending value. So we'll, we'll always include the start number. We will always go up until one before our ending number. Make sense? If I add a third number, it lets me choose how much the iterator is going to change each time through the loop. Because with one and two numbers, the default is that it's going to increase by one each time through the loop. However, if I add a third number, let's say I say for I in range one, comma, 10, comma, two, I have three numbers here. Let's look at what they mean. The first value is our starting place, which again is included. Number two is our ending value, once again, not included. Just like the other two types of loop, or the other two uh, ways to use our range, uh, the ending value is never going to be included. The closest you can get to your ending value is one short. Um, I'm going to look at another example where it doesn't even get to one short. And our third value is the step size. That's how much your iterator will change each time through your loop. So given this definition, given this range, what values can we expect to see? If my... If my range starts at one, I'll print one. What is the next value that I will see? Three. Three. All right, because we increased by two. One plus two is three. What is the value after that? Five. Five. Then? Seven. Seven. And next? Nine. Nine. Is that the last number? Yeah. Yes. It is, because nine is one less than 10. So that is going to be the last value in our loop. So if I show my answer, boom, we have the same five numbers here. Now, if I change my number, my step size to three, what do you think our list of numbers will be? First number is still going to be one. What's our second number going to be? Four. It's going to be four. What's our third number going to be? Seven. Seven. Are we going to go any further? Nope. That is our full list of numbers. So if the next value in the sequence, because our next value would be 10, right? If this number is greater than or equal to our ending value, it will not be included. So we're going to stop at 7 so that because 10 would be 
greater than or equal to our starting or our ending number. So it will not be included. Make sense? All right. And our last little thing to note, if our third number is negative, that is allowed. We are allowed to have a negative step size. When we do that, we need to make sure that our starting value is bigger than our ending value because then we will go, we'll start at 10 and we'll decrease by two until we hit one. And in this case, we are gonna wait until we are uh, no longer greater than our uh, ending value. Um, if you use a negative step size, but you have a smaller uh, starting then ending value, your loop is essentially just gonna get skipped. You will not run anything um, because there's no way to get to positive five from one by going in the negative direction. And the same is true if you had 10 comma one comma positive five, there's no way to get down to one from 10 by going up, right? So you wanna make sure that your, your direction, your step size is going to match your direction for your starting and ending. Otherwise your for loop is essentially just gonna get skipped because the range will be empty. Does that all make sense? Cool, cool, cool. That is our lesson for today.